about uh, 40, 40 participants. Thank you very much for sharing your Friday afternoon with us. My name is Barbara Lattimore. I'm a senior project associate with the SMBFTA Center. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for a discussion about healthcare disparities and strategies for equitable engagement with Black veterans. Our esteemed speaker today will be Juliet McClendon, PhD, Director of Medical Affairs for Big Health. Some of the objectives that you will walk away with today is to develop a shared definition of race, culture, and racism, understand the similarities and differences between racial trauma and PTSD, identify symptoms of racism-related stress, and trauma or RST among black veterans. And finally, you will be able to explore some clinical considerations when interacting with veterans who have experienced race related stress and trauma. Thank you very much. Next slide. We're very happy to have our federal partner with us today, Ms. Stacy Owens. So at this time, we'll ask Stacy if she will bring us greetings from SAMHSA. Hello, everyone. Um, as Dr. Lattimore stated, I'm Stacy Owens. I'm the Acting Military and Veterans Affairs Liaison for SAMHSA. I'd like to take a moment to welcome you all to today's TA call, which is the first call in a series focused on veterans of color. And we're so happy to have Dr. Juliet McClendon discussing the needs of Black veterans. Um, you know, evidence shows us that the best way to disrupt and combat race-based inequity is to identify instances where it has happened and to discuss strategies to move forward in an equitable manner. So we really appreciate Dr. McClendon sharing her expertise with us today. And we also appreciate all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about this important topic. And I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Lattimore. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you for taking your time out to be with us today. Next slide, please. I'd like to start with a disclaimer. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Agency, or SAMHSA, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Veterans Health Administration or the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Next slide, please. So we'll start with the agenda of how we will spend our time together this afternoon. We'll go over housekeeping. Many of you have already introduced yourselves in the chat. For those who have not, please continue to do that. Uh, as we stated, this presentation is a discussion about healthcare disparities, strategies for equitable engagement with Black veterans. When you have any questions, please feel free to raise your hand in the chat feature or type your question in the chat and we will make sure your questions are acknowledged and answered at the end of the workshop. And then we'll have next steps and adjourn. Next slide, please. Please identify yourself each time that you speak and mute your computer speakers and phones when not speaking. These sessions are highly interactive. Please feel free to participate and always keep others in mind. Again, to allow more time for discussion, we've already discussed introducing yourself in the chat, sharing your name, your title, your agency, and what team you are representing today. Next slide, please. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Juliet McClendon to you all today. A little bit about Dr. McClendon. Dr. McClendon is the Director of Medical Affairs at Big Health. She is a clinical psychologist by training. Her work emphasizes evidence-based practice, culturally responsive care, and mental health equity. She received her PhD in psychology from Washington University in St. Louis and a BA in psychology from Harvard University. She completed her postdoctoral training at VA Boston Healthcare Center as an advanced women's health fellow. Dr. McClendon has over a dozen peer-reviewed research articles focusing on the impact of racism and discrimination on mental health 
and intervention approaches that can mitigate this impact. Dr. McClendon recently completed a study of an innovative intervention that targets RST and trauma to improve health and treatment engagement among veterans of color. Now, her work focuses on expanding the reach of evidence-based interventions in a scalable digital format for individuals traditionally left behind by traditional mental health systems. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Juliet McClendon. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this work. Um, so I am, as was mentioned, the director of medical affairs at Big Health, and this is a career move I recently made, um, but I spent the three years prior to that at the VA as a um, postdoctoral fellow and then as a research scientist. Um, thank you so much for the disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> I don't have to do as much explaining, but again, all opinions are mine in this presentation. And next slide. Um, so before I move on to talking about my work, um, I just want to say that I'm just so excited to have so many people here from all over the country um, listening to um, me discuss some of what I've been working on and some of what I've taken away from the work that I've done with veterans. Um, and so I'm excited to share some of that with you. Um, so some of my work includes, and you can just kind of click through this. Um, mental health care and equity, stress-related mechanisms of ethno-racial health disparities. So this one in particular focuses on understanding how stress leads to um, or contributes to racial disparities in health broadly, um, racial stress and trauma specifically. So as I worked on understanding stress-related mechanisms of health, I came to find that um, one stress-related or one stressor that was not um, examined as thoroughly in the literature was discrimination. Um, and so I became very interested in understanding how discrimination impacts the mental health of people of color and how we might be able to um, uh, develop interventions that may address some of the impacts of discrimination on health. And I'm also very passionate about evidence-based treatment as well as culturally responsive treatment and how we can better train clinicians to provide culturally responsive treatment to um, veterans of color um, and veterans from other different cultural backgrounds. Next slide. Thank you. So first I wanna start off, what I always do with these presentations is I really go through a number of definitions um, because I know in my work what I've seen, and this is true for um, individuals across the range of different backgrounds is that we often have different ways that we define and think about um, uh, issues related to racism or definitions of things like racism. And so I always like to get us all on the same page. So first I wanna define health equity. Health equity is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. And the way we can visualize this, which I really love, and some of you have probably seen this before, is here with equality, we give everyone the same supports. But that means that if people are starting off with lower access to opportunities or at a lower sort of level of um, ability, or they're sort of just, there are things that are sort of keeping them lower than somebody else, giving everyone the same thing is not going to allow everyone the same ability to, um, to reach their full level of health. Um, however, when we look at equity, which is what I talk about, that means giving everyone the supports that they need based on their unique circumstances in order to help them achieve optimal health. And then justice is sort of what we really work towards. So right now we're really trying to work towards equality and equity, well, really equity. But from there, where we hope to get to is to eliminate those barriers that individuals have that require them to have sort of different supports based on their circumstances so that everyone is able to reach optimal health and has the same opportunities to reach optimal health um, and don't need those additional supports. Next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna jump in here now in talking about um, black veterans. So black service members have been a critical part of the military since the Revolutionary War. So black veterans or black individuals have always served in American wars since the beginning of America. 
And currently there are um, about 2.5 million black veterans in the United States. So individuals who've separated from the military. Um, and that's what I'll be focusing on today is veterans. Veterans of color, uh, the veterans of color population is actually predicted to increase over the next 20 years um, from about 23% to about 33%, 36%, you know, it depends on sort of what you read. Um, but it, it's going to in increase, it's going to expand um, quite, uh, quite a lot. And so this is why I found that it would be really necessary and important to address some of the issues and some of the gaps in healthcare that we're seeing for veterans of color specifically. And in thinking about equity and giving people the supports that they need based on where they're starting, what kinds of additional supports might veterans of color need in order to reach that optimal state of health? Um, what's also a really interesting um, uh, note is that, uh, you know, we also know that the female um, veteran population is growing, and there is actually a higher percentage of female veterans within the Black veteran population than within other veteran um, populations or subpopulations. So we know that um, when we talk about Black veterans, we also really have to think about female veterans as well, and those intersectional uh, identities of being Black and being a woman. Next slide. What I also want to comment on before I get into definitions is that um, ethno-racial health disparities and health disparities refer to um, differences in health that are typically unjust or sort of based on um, based on uh, systematic barriers, et cetera. Um, and um, there are absolutely ethno-racial disparities in health within the VA. Um, and Primarily, we see the majority of these in the quality of care that people receive, um, as well as health outcomes. Um, we see less differences in utilization of healthcare, um, but we certainly see um, disparities in many different health areas. But there's less work on mental health disparities. And so that's where my work um, at the VA and with veterans has really focused. Um, next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna jump a little bit into my research to show you that we do see disparities in a few examples showing that we do see disparities and inequities in mental health outcomes and in mental health among veterans. Um, so this is a study that I completed with Dr. Don Vogt at the National Center for PTSD at the VA. Um, it was published in Journal of Anxiety Disorders a couple years ago. And what I wanna bring your attention to here is down here that black multiracial and Hispanic and Latino, or Hispanic or Latinx veterans had higher rates of positive PTSD screens compared with white and with Asian veterans. So they're at higher risk for PTSD. And these were veterans who had recently separated from the military within the past 90 days before they completed this survey. Um, and, and I'll also add that this was a survey of um, about close to 10,000 veterans who had recently separated from the military. Um, and what I want you to see here in yellow is that what we found when we accounted for age, household income and education, or SES, trauma exposure, so how, 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 at how many points in their life, like childhood, pre-joining the military, during the military, after the military, how much trauma they had been exposed to or experienced, as well as general life stress, so stress in a number of domains, including discrimination, family stress, um, financial stress, et cetera, as well as social support, how supported they felt by their social community. Once we took into account all of those factors, we still saw that multiracial female veterans were two times more likely than white female veterans to um, have a positive PTSD screen. And black men remained one and a half times more likely than white male veterans to screen positive for PTSD. So what we're seeing here is that we need more information to better understand what's contributing particularly to these disparities among multiracial women and Black men. And I will note that multiracial individuals have really been um, really focused on in the veteran population in terms of understanding what their health outcomes look like if there are health disparities. And so one thing I'll say here is I think we really need more research on multiracial veterans, particularly as the U.S. is becoming more multiracial. Next slide. 
Okay, now to jump into some definitions. And before I get into this, I'm wondering if there are any questions or comments about what I just presented. Feel free to raise your hand or just speak up. Okay. All right, so jumping into some definitions. Um, I alluded to um, health disparities. So again, these are systematic, potentially avoidable differences in health between groups of people. Um, and specifically between groups of people who have different relative positions in society in terms of wealth, power, and prestige. So we can all, I think, understand and agree that Black individuals are on, sort of at this lower level of the social hierarchy, um, according to wealth, power, and prestige compared to um, white individuals. And so we often talk about health disparities as sort of these systematic avoidable differences between um, a marginalized group like Black individuals and a dominant group like white individuals. Next slide. I also really like to define these sort of three ways that we think about um, identity when it comes to race um, and ethnicity. Um, now, ethnicity and culture should also overlap here. So that's just a little uh, design mistake there. <laughs> but um, what I just wanna focus on here is that race is really a social construct that focuses on physical features and phenotype. Um, and race was really created in the United States back in the 1600s in order to really create a division between those who were sort of the um, lower class or like poor white um, individuals and indentured servants and the African um, enslaved people who were brought over from Africa to create a division between them by providing additional privileges to white individuals that sort of helped drive those groups apart because the there was a big rebellion where those groups came together. And so there was this concerted effort to make sure that sort of the, the people who were um, sort of poor or who didn't have access to property and um, even freedom were not able to combine together to uprise against the ruling class. That's where race in the United States as we know it really started to get ingrained into our society. So this has been hundreds of years. Um, on the other hand, culture, culture really refers to um, sort of values, norms, traditions, sort of the way that we live our lives, our lifestyles. Um, and ethnicity really refers to sort of nationality and ancestry. And so the reason why I have this slide is because these can all overlap or they can be different. Somebody, you may have two people who identify as Black, one may be African American and have descended from enslaved people in the United States, and someone else may be Caribbean American and may have immigrated here from the Caribbean or that they may have grown up here, but that may just be their background. And there are very different experiences um, of race for individuals who, for example, grew up in the United States versus people who immigrated to the United States. And I've seen these sort of differences in viewpoint and understanding of race um, in working with veterans who have these different ethnic backgrounds, even though they share a racial background. Um, and the same with culture. And with all of these sort of ba uh, identity factors, um, we have to understand that people may identify more or less with, with these sort of categories that they're placed in or the ways that they grew up. And so it's important for us to understand how an individual um, connects with these identities. Next slide. Um, and then I always like to define people of color. So I define people of color, um, which is a term I use often, um, as um, any group of people who's been um, traditionally marginalized and subjugated within the United States. And today, of course, we're focusing on Black and African American individuals. Next slide. Okay, so this is a big one. What is racism? And you can go ahead and click. Thank you. So I, I, I often... <laughs> like to ask people, um, like, what do you think racism is? How would you define it? Um, but I have my answer here, so I'm not gonna ask you all. <laughs> you could just read it. But racism, the way that I define it when I talk about racism in um, these kinds of talks and in my work is that racism is prejudice plus power. So that's, it's this idea of bias of sort of um, this thought that um, your group is superior to another group, um, that that other group is inferior to your group, and um, that's the prejudice part. But what's important about thinking about racism is that it's not just prejudice. 
It's also about power. And so we have to understand that racism is really that ideology that of superiority, that race, I mean, I'm sorry, that prejudice, along with that prejudice leading to the unequal and unfair distribution of resources and power in various domains, which favors the dominant culture, which in our country is white Americans, in order to maintain a social structure of white power and supremacy. So racism, again, is about that prejudice, plus the fact that that prejudice leads to power differentials um, and power inequities within our society. So I hope you are able to accept this definition. I know uh, people have a lot of different ways of thinking about this, um, but this is the definition that I'm gonna be um, focusing on today. Next slide. So let's talk about some different forms of racism. Um, institutional and systemic racism. So these are policies and formal or informal practices um, that, um, that are um, unequally sort of di distributed within the population. So I really wanna highlight here informal practices because there are very few formal policies that are discriminatory or racist in our country and in our government. However, there can be informal practices that have similar effects of reducing um, the ability for us to reach equity. Um, so for example, if you ever hear somebody say, well, that's the way we've always done things, that's a red flag that there may be some informal policies in place that may be contributing to some of the inequities you might see in your agencies or among patients that you work, your patient population um, or in your state or whomever. Um, and so it's important to not only think about these policies that are written down, but also think about the informal ways that things have always been done that may be um, further perpetuating inequities. So some examples of institutional or systemic racism are the over-policing of communities of color, property taxes, funding education, which means that those who live in lower income areas have less money for education and that leads to inequities in education and that tends to impact people of color and particularly black and African American people more strongly. Um, lack of representation of clinicians of color in a hospital is an example of institutional racism and a lack of representation in leadership is another example. So these are just some examples of what institutional or systemic racism might look like. I think in the past year and a half, of the past year and a half or so, the past year, um, I think more people have really started to understood what institutional and systemic racism really is and what it looks like. Um, and uh, this is just to reinforce that. And some of you may be, may be thinking about this for the first time. Next slide. Now let's talk about microaggressions. I'm sure this is a term that many of you have heard, um, but Microaggressions are subtle slights and insults that communicate demeaning messages to individuals with marginalized identities. A couple of things I want to highlight here. Microaggressions is not meant to say that these are small um, hurts. Um, microaggression, the micro refers to interpersonal interactions. And then we can also talk about macroaggressions, which refer to that systemic and institutional racism that I talked about earlier. So microaggressions are really these interpersonal interactions that occur. And what's important here, and I'll share some examples in a moment, but what's important here as well is that microaggressions occur um, with the sort of, um, I guess you could say victim or target of those microaggressions being a person from a, with a marginalized identity. So it's something that makes them feel more marginalized um, or communicates something demeaning to them. In addition, uh, really, the, the point of microaggressions and understanding them is that it's not about the intention of who said the microaggression and whether or not they were intending to hurt the other person, because often they're not, but it is about how the target receives um, the comment. So some, one individual may receive the comment and not feel that it's racist. Another individual may receive the comment and feel it's a microaggression, and it's important to really be um, open and under and, and empathetic towards that person who experienced the microaggression if they're, if they're feeling offended by it. So some examples, something like asking someone, where are you from? And then they tell you, you don't know, where are you from, right? So, I mean, I, I'm sure that there are people in this, in this room who have, who have gotten this and the translation that people can feel is you don't belong here. I know you're not really American. You must not be here. 
Uh, you must not be from here. Um, next. We want to diversify our workforce, but we don't want to lower our hiring standards. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. I've done a lot of work around trying to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion within different um, uh, the different places that I've been. And this is something that I have heard before. Applicant, and, and the translation is that applicants of color are not as capable as white applicants. You're good at math, right? Um, this is something that oftentimes like um, Asian Americans may hear um, because of this model minority myth. And the translation is like, everybody like you is good at math. And especially for somebody who may not be good at math, this is something that sort of can feel demeaning or feel like, oh, well, you know, you're not living up to the standards of your culture and some and things like that. I don't even think of you as black translation is, you know, this is something I've heard, you know, the, the translation is, well, you know, black people act a certain way that is not good and you don't act that way. So I don't even think of you as black. Again, just demeaning my entire racial background, my entire race and community um, by saying something like this. And, and so that's the translation there. I think there's one more. You're so well-spoken. I know, I, I bet, you know, this is just one that we've all heard, you know, even uh, uh, we've even heard it in, you know, political discourse, but it's this, the, the translation is people like you don't speak proper English. So I'm so surprised that you can speak proper English. Next slide. You can go ahead and click. Um, and finally, a, a few more versions of racism. Implicit or unconscious racism really refers to um, sort of these really ingrained unconscious biases um, and racist attitudes that we may hold um, that we're not necessarily aware of. So if you asked us, if, if somebody asked someone consciously like, hey, do you hold this racist belief? They might say no, but deep down they do. And when they, and especially when under stress or pressure or time constraints, those biases can come to the surface much more readily. We see this in um, healthcare where, you know, we do have these time pressures. We do have these, um, uh, yeah, a lot of stress, um, especially if you're meeting someone for the first time. So it's much easier for those biases to come to the surface. And we know we all have them because they've been intentionally ingrained in us by our society since we were born. Aversive racism is the sense that racism doesn't just have to be so direct and overt. It can also be sort of um, passive in a way. So um, for example, if somebody is feeling like they're not being included in meetings they should be included in, or if in the office, their office is the furthest office away from everybody else or in a different spot, or if they're not being provided the resources that they need, um, despite asking multiple times, that's aversive racism. It's kind of this like, I just don't want to deal with you. I feel threatened by you, or I don't know how to handle you. And so people just sort of avoid that person. Stereotype threat is this idea that individuals, when a stereotype of their group is activated, so like, let's say somebody is about to take a test and somebody says something to them like, oh, you know, as they're walking in the room, oh, hey, do you play ball? Um, you know, that sort of stereotype of, you know, Black people only being good at sports might be activated, then they go in to take the test, that's on their mind, and it can impact their academic performance. And this can happen in a, a variety of arenas at work, et cetera. And then internalized racism, of course, is this idea that um, because uh, um, as a society, we are very much bombarded with messages that um, sort of elevate the dominant culture and denigrate other cultures, we can start to internalize some of those beliefs and start to believe negative stereotypes about our own groups or about other racial ethnic groups. Next. Okay, now this slide talks about, okay, so we're, we've talked about racism, we've defined racism in all its different forms. And what I wanna tell you here is that there is well-established evidence that experiences of racism and discrimination contribute to negative mental health outcomes. So you can just start clicking around a little bit here. Elevated depression symptoms, conduct problems, delinquency and lower self-esteem in black youth, greater risk for psychiatric disorders, more severe psychiatric symptoms, chronic health conditions, worse birth outcomes, substance and alcohol misuse, de delays in seeking health care, health care mistrust, lower quality of life, psychological distress. And I think there's one more suicidal ideation. So 
racism and discrimination has been shown in a wealth of research to contribute to all of these kinds of outcomes. And I didn't even really include a lot of the physical health outcomes that racism impacts, like cardiovascular risk, hypertension. Um, but these are just, uh, this really focuses on the mental health outcomes that they're associated with. Um, and so we see how racism and discrimination affects health from seeking health care, from the experience of health care, all the way to health outcomes. Next slide. And now I want to highlight some examples of racism in the military and in the VA, um, since this is what we're really talking about today. So in 2014, the military banned certain hairstyles, and they were hairstyles that were commonly worn by Black women, um, protective hairstyles like dreads or locks or three braids. Um, and these various, uh, or braids, these various hairstyles were deemed matted and unkempt. Finally, three years later, after much backlash, the ban was lifted in 2017, specifically after several complaints and letters from um, the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, and so we can see how, um, how that racism just shows up and it may not even be intentional, but we see that these rules disproportionately affect a particular segment of the military. And this is these are policies that can make people feel like they don't belong here, like they cannot be themselves, um, like they are breaking rules um, and things like that. And so this is a, just a, one example of a, way, of a way in which the military has um, demonstrated racism. Um, another example is the Air Force released findings of a racial disparity review recently and what they found were that there were racial disparities in the Air Force and for um, um, uh, individuals in the Space Force, um, uh, where Black and African American airmen and space professionals were not, were not being treated equally in terms of discipline and the opportunity to develop their career and further their career. Um, and so this, was, this is a recent finding, and, and this is something that they're working on. Next slide. Other examples. Um, there is, there is sort of a widely known history of disparities in receiving benefits um, for uh, not, I mean, not just mental health problems, physical health too, but particularly for mental health problems like PTSD, for example, um, where black veterans and other veterans of color were not equally likely sort of, you can show the same, you can have the same sort of presenting issues and if you're a white veteran, you would get the benefits. And if you were a black veteran, you wouldn't. And obviously this didn't happen with every single person, but there was a trend showing that there were disparities in benefits, um, um, in, in VA benefits. In addition, we there's been research looking at healthcare discrimination. So this um, study by um, Dr. Hausman and her colleagues um, at the Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion, the VA, you can click. What, what they found was that um, veterans who received their care in the VA reported just as much as just as much discrimination as veterans who received care outside of the VA. This other um, article here, pre, uh, perceptions of healthcare, health status, and discrimination among African American veterans, found that more than fifty percent of Black of Black veterans reported discrimination in healthcare, and that those perceptions of discrimination in healthcare was associated with lower satisfaction with their healthcare, lower perceived quality of their healthcare, and lower physical functioning. So to sum up, to so sum this section up, we can just see that racism um, does persist in the military and in the VA, and I, the military and the VA are taking steps to try and mitigate these issues. Um, and we need to continue to do this work to really understand um, where we see these inequities and then also study what study the solutions that we may use to mitigate these problems. Um, next, thank you. Okay, so this is another um, one of my research studies published in um, the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation. This was the same cohort of veterans as I talked about before from the Veterans Metrics Initiative, about close to 10,000 veterans. We looked at a subsample in this 
um, study of veterans who had, this was a longitudinal study. So veterans who had stayed in the study through, um, I think a, a couple of years. So what we found here, um, well, what I looked at here is changes in PTSD severity over six months. So if you look at the y-axis or the horizontal axis, this is showing changes in PTSD symptom severity. So this is like how big um, that change was. So everyone took the PCL, the um, uh, which is a standard clinically validated instrument for measuring PTSD symptoms. Um, and we looked at how much those symptoms changed over a six month, six month period. So that's what that y-axis is. The x-axis or the horizontal axis shows um, individuals who reported lower levels of, of stress related to discrimination versus higher levels of stress related to discrimination. We didn't break it up into low versus high. We just saw like as it goes up, as it was a questionnaire that gave people options between like one and five. So like sort of as people went up. Um, and so what we see here is that discriminatory stress had a stronger effect on increases in PTSD symptoms for black women versus black men. And what that means is that um, for black women who experienced higher levels of discriminatory stress, their PTSD symptoms increased more so than black men. So, so PTSD symptoms for black men didn't really increase much as we compared sort of those who reported lower levels of discriminatory stress versus higher levels. But for black women, there was a big difference in changes in PTSD symptoms for those who reported lower levels of discriminatory stress versus higher levels. And so what we see here is I, I alluded, I alluded to this earlier in talking about intersectionality and the fact that there is a large percentage of um, there's a large representation of women within the black veteran population, but that there, that there are intersections between race and gender and what inter what intersectionality really means is that, um, you know, so in thinking about black women, black women are black. So they experience the marginalization of being a black person in America. They're women, so they experience the marginalization of being a woman in America. But there's also a way that those two um, identities intersect and interweave so that people start to experience, in, experience interlocking systems of oppression that really um, uh, sort of are not just about one of their identities or the other, but that combination of the two of them. So we can think back to like when people were talking about like welfare queens back in the 80s, right? That was really an in intersectional racism, talking specifically about Black women. And that was something that Black women in particular experienced that maybe other groups of individuals did not. And so what this study really showed was that the intersection of race and gender is really important to understanding the impact of discrimination on the mental health of black veterans. Next slide. And this is one other study that I completed. Um, I'm sorry, it's cut off a little here at the bottom um, with um, Dr. Dr. Leslie Hausman um, at the Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion, where we looked at cumulative disadvantage, meaning people who have multiple disadvantages or multiple aspects of marginalization um, and how those multiple aspects of marginalization, or I'll just call it cumulative disadvantage, um, contributed to depression symptoms and pain symptoms among veterans with osteoarthritis. And we wanted to understand um, the role of discrimination in this relationship. Right. So what we hypothesized was that people with more aspects of marginalization would experience higher depression symptoms and more pain. Um, and uh, and that's what we found. So they experience more perceived dis discrimination, more symptoms of depression and more pain. And these disadvantages we looked at were people who made less than twenty thousand dollars a year, women, African-Americans and those who were disabled. And what we ultimately found was that perceived discrimination was really ex partly explained that relationship between cumulative disadvantage and increased depression um, in among people with osteoarthritis, um, as well as in explaining the increased pain symptoms among people with osteoarthritis. So what that 
suggests is that discrimination really mediates the effect of cumulative disadvantage on depression and pain severity in this population. And so we can see that discrimination is one mechanism by which social determinants of health like income and disability impact mental and physical health. And what's really stunning here is that um, half of our sample was black and half of our, or half our sample was African-American and half of our sample was white. 83.5% of individuals reported experiencing at least some discrimination in their everyday lives. And there are forms of discrimination that non, uh, or that white people experience, you know, there's not just racial discrimination, there's, there's weight discrimination, there's um, income discrimination, there's um, gender discrimination, that's what we're getting at here by looking at these multiple aspects of disadvantage. Um, but many people are experiencing discrimination in their everyday lives and we're showing here that it contributes to negative health outcomes. Next slide. Okay, now moving on from talking more about um, sort of how racism impacts health. And I know we, we're running, we don't have a lot of time. Um, and I wanna get to questions, but I do wanna just touch here on racial trauma. This is the idea that people can develop traumatic stress symptoms in reaction to the psychological and emotional injury of racism. You can just click on through this slide and go to the next one. And these are just leading researchers in, um, uh, understanding racial trauma and defining it. Next slide. And so racial trauma um, occurs because racism is a unique stressor to people of color. Racism can lead to certainly physical injuries, but, we're, but when we talk about racial trauma, we're talking about these more emotional and psychological injuries that occur as a result of racism that may accumulate beyond a person's ability to cope and then may lead to traumatic stress symptoms without even having experienced like a criterion A event, meaning those events that are said in the um, diagnostic and statistic manual to be required for a diagnosis of PTSD, which are um, threatened, uh, having your life threatened or um, having a serious injury or sexual violence. So racial trauma talks about when people experience traumatic stress symptoms due to not those criterion A stressors, but these sort of emotional and psychological in injuries. Next slide. And this is just sort of demonstrating that people start out with some predisposing factors over here on the left. They have a particular stress threshold based on those predisposing factors. And as they ex cumulatively experience racial stressors and racism, eventually they may pass their threshold and then may start experiencing racial trauma. Next slide. And you can click through these quickly, but these are some of the symptoms of racial trauma. They tend to overlap with both depression symptoms and P uh, anxiety symptoms and PTSD symptoms. Um, so we see sort of this um, uh, amalgamation of symptoms of a lot of sort of a few different already defined mental health diagnoses um, that all come into one place and, and, and affect that person. Uh, and you can click, okay. And so I've already sort of talked about this, right? Experiences of racism can cause PTSD. So experiences of racism can certainly be life-threatening or um, can lead to injury or can involve sexual violence. And that, so that can lead to PTSD as defined in the DSM. But there are also experiences of racism that can lead to traumatic stress symptoms that don't fit into that criterion A. Another big difference between racial trauma and PTSD is that racism is an ongoing stressor or trauma. So post-traumatic stress disorder suggests that the um, stressor or the trauma is over, right? Whereas when we talk, talk about racism and discrimination, it's never over. It's something that people experience regularly. And so how do we take in, that into account when we're thinking about intervention? Um, and so what it suggests is that current evidence-based treatments for PTSD may not be the most effective at addressing racial trauma. And the other question is, should racial trauma be in the DSM? It's an, I, I think it's a really open question and it's a really interesting question. I'm not gonna delve into it right now, but um, there's this question of, do we pathologize racial trauma or do we not pathologize it because it's a potentially adapt, maybe it, gets, it can get into a maladaptive 
spate, like it can get to a point of it being maladaptive and it interferes in the person's functioning. But at the same time, are there ways that racial um, reactions to racism can be adaptive um, for the individual and help them cope? Next slide. So I'm gonna stop there. No, you can stay here. I'm gonna stop here. Um, I was gonna get into some sort of treatment things, but I wanna see if anybody has any questions, comments, um, anything like that. I had a comment. Yes. Hi, my name is Gregory. I work for the city of Las Vegas and this has been very educational. Um, I definitely appreciate this um, presentation. Uh, it definitely opened some eyes, uh, opened my eyes to um, macro and microaggressions specifically, but also the the experience of racism. It's not only external, it's also internal. Um, did a little admission on my own and <laughs> I thought you were white. So <laughs> when you were speaking, but it was, it wasn't intentional. It was just a thought process. So I think that when we were, when you were discussing it earlier, that microaggressions, macroaggressions, they're not always external, they're internal as well um, in our thought process, as well as how, how we reflect on ourselves as, um, a marginalized group. So I thought that that was very interesting and I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We, it, it's really important for us to be very vigilant about our biases and notice when they're coming up. Other questions or comments? Yes, this is Adrena from um, Ohio. I work at the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So. We also know that uh, Alzheimer's and dementia is, uh, runs higher in African-American communities. And uh, some of the conversation has been around that accumulative stress and what it does uh, to our bodies. So I'm just thinking in terms of what you're also referencing on some of your slides, if, if that would not be an intersection uh, piece to your work? Um, I don't specifically study cognitive um, issues or cognitive um, diagnoses, but absolutely the way that I um, conceptualize the impact of, of stress on health is that yes, there's this accumulation of stress over time that leads to particular health outcomes. And, um, uh, and that in, people of color have a higher burden of stress. And they experience a higher burden of stress, not just because they experience a higher burden of discrimination and racism, but they experience a higher burden of other stressors related to finances, related to family caregiving, et cetera. And so those additional stressors absolutely accumulate over time and impact the brain and impact the body in ways that can lead to chronic illness. So Dr. McClendon, we have a couple of questions that were put in the chat. So mm -hmm. I will start with the first one from Gwendolyn Coley. And she asked, is it racism if someone owns a business? Is a BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, and hires only B-I-P-O-Cs? Well, I think the question you have to ask yourself is how does that impact the power structure of our society? Does that have an impact on, does that have a subjugating impact on non-BIPOC individuals? Is it getting in the way of their ability for opportunities and to progress? So that's what we really have to ask ourselves, I think, when we talk about racism. So in my opinion, most likely that is not racism because there is not a way that it takes power away from uh, non-BIPOC individuals. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm not sure about the legal definition of discrimination, perhaps, because I know there's a lot of rules around hiring and things like that. But as far as sort of the definition of racism we're working with today, um, I would not put that in the category of racism. Thank you. And one more uh, question from Adriana. 
Uh, do you have any knowledge of any screening instruments for racial stress and trauma? Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, I would say the most, um, the easiest one to use is the trauma symptoms of discrimination scale, which is um, created by Monica Williams. And um, I'll put it here in the chat. Um, and it basically um, sort of maps a lot of the symptoms onto the PTSD symptoms, but specifically asks, asks about experiencing these symptoms around experiences of discrimination. So this is what I used in my study. Um, and it's, it's a validated and reliable scale. So thank you very much for this presentation, Dr. McClendon. I do have um, one question uh, regarding the unconscious bias concept. As clinicians and providers who work in the field and those of us working with the SMVF population, uh, some of us may not be aware of our own unconscious bias. So when working with Black veterans, how can we become more aware of our own unconscious bias? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that there, there's, there are a lot of resources out there to do this. There are a lot of trainings, there are a lot of courses that focus on anti-racism and um, sort of understanding our own biases and our own awareness. Uh, so a, a good place to start just now is to really, um, there's this great framework called the addressing framework. Um, I'll write it down and you can look this up. And what it does is that it lists all these different areas of identity and which identities are privileged and which identities are marginalized. And you can go through that and think about your own identities and where you fit in. We all have some marginalized identities and some, do and some um, privileged identities. And so you can start to understand where your identities fall. And so then where you may have some areas of ignorance about margin that marginalized groups when you have that privileged um, identity. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is engaging with media, books, uh, YouTube videos, documentaries, et cetera, about the hist Black history and about the history of African Americans in the United States, about the history of African Americans in the military, engaging with that information and learning about um, what that experience has been like, because that will just help you to internalize and really have a lot more empathy and understanding for the experiences of Black individuals. So a book I really highly recommend is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Um, that is a book I read several years ago that really opened my eyes to the systemic nature of racism um, and uh, really helped me to really understand the ways that these, uh, that racism has really been baked in. Um, I think much. Of I'm course. Sorry, I was just going to say, I think there's one other person who has their hand raised. Yes, Sean. That's who I'm getting to, Sean. Thank oh, you. Oh, great. <laughs> Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much. This was a wonderful presentation. Um, I, my question is simple. Will it be possible for this uh, video and um, presentation and your contact because I'm going to have more follow-up questions uh, in the coming days. That's my question. Yes, Thank you. you very much. Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me on LinkedIn um, and you can also find me on Twitter and feel free to reach out um, uh, if you have more questions or want to set up a time to talk. Be, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. So one more question we have time for, and that's Gregory. Uh, yes, I also um, want to know if colorism plays a factor into any of this as well. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing that up. That's such a great point and actually something I, I need to add to this presentation. Um, so I talk a lot about racism in terms of dominant culture versus sort of the uh, marginalized groups. But colorism is a really important um, topic to talk about. So colorism is really this idea that the closer to whiteness somebody is, so the lighter their skin, the more Eurocentric their features, the way they talk, uh, their education, things like that, 
can um, gives them more privilege in society. So for me as a light skinned black woman, I have more privilege in society just because of my skin color, because I look closer to being white. Um, and those with darker skin um, are sort of even more marginalized, even though we share a common racial identity. And I think that that is absolutely something that um, we really need to think about. And it's also something that can cause um, disturbances within black communities or within black families, even um, when people are different color. So it's a, it's a result of white supremacy saying white is right. And so whoever's closer to white is better, essentially. Um, and it's a, and it is something that is ongoing. I think it's something that we don't talk about as much as we should. But I do hope that that, that conversation will continue to progress, particularly within, the, within Black communities. So thank you very much again, Dr. McClendon, for such an enlightening and eye-opening presentation. On behalf of our program area director, Terry Hay, our federal partners, I see that Ms. Andrea Lee was able to join us. Uh, we thank you so much and all of the staff at the SMBFTA Center. And thank you to all of our participants who are able to join us this afternoon. So we're gonna close out with some next steps. So if we can go to the next step slide. If not, I can just talk about it. Uh, we will also be presenting uh, Veterans of Color. Next slide. Part two, supporting emotional wellness of Hispanic and Latino SMBF. And this is scheduled to take place on August 16th, 2021 from 12 to 1 Eastern Standard Time. So make sure you go to that link and register for another enlightening presentation regarding veterans of color. So if there's nothing else, we are going to give you all two minutes back to your day. Again, thank you very much, Dr. McClendon. Thank you very much for the SMVF population attending. And we hope that everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank, thank you. Me. Thanks everyone for attending.